welcome back friends to our fourth episode of converse with deepak today we have somebody very special who is from teaching industry and she is here for a very special reason to talk about how to communicate the most important member of our family our children share his is a devoted wife mother of six and grandmother of nine she doesn't look like she has been a teacher for 11 years and has a hand she has masters degree in special education driven by her desire to both grow personally and to help others she has worked with a team of ladies to facilitate love and logic parenting classes in her school district for the last 6 years one skill that she has found fundamentally important in all her roles is the art of communication whether it is as a teacher to a student coworker to coworker parent to a child understanding all the ways we communicate and the effect of each approach has and more meaningful outcomes in this whole process welcome share to this show called converse with deepak thank you deepak it's an honor to be here thank you and today let's talk about how to communicate with our most important family members in our family our children time has gone when we used to listen very obediently to our parents these days every child has their own thoughts every child has a very strong opinion we will talk to you with your experience in detail in this session but before we move further i would like our audience to know a little bit about yourself well i'd love to share that and i love this topic I know I shared uh in the speech that you originally heard that when I grew up I did not have love and logic principles and I grew up to be a mom that lectured um lectured lectured rescued and what I didn't realize and I know we're going to get deeper into this is the underlying messages that I was giving my children mm-hmm. and we have to understand that 93% of everything we communicate is nonverbal. So when I would lecture, lecture, lecture and rescue, really what I was saying is you can't handle this. You can't come up with a solution. You need mommy to do it for you. And that does not build a child's esteem. It does not build their t- uh, character. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is telling is not teaching. teaching is very much a collaborative uh act and not an authoritarian act now there's moments that as parents we've got to say it could be an emergency i need you to do exactly what i say and exactly how i say it but there should that should just be brief moments uh the rest should be a very collaborative uh and that's what we're going to talk about process of teaching our children to think teaching our children to be respectful teaching them to solve problems and teaching them to be a valued member of our family as a unit absolutely absolutely so in your profile i have uh, read this beautiful word love and logic what is this is this an organization is this a not for profit can you please share with our audience a little bit about this Okay, I'd love to. Love and Logic is uh was started by Jim and Charles Fay out of Golden, Colorado. They have the Love and Logic uh Institute. And it's actually been one of the businesses that have been greatly affected by COVID and they they've all but shut down. Yeah. But we're in the district, we're going to continue to share the Love and Logic principles. We share it both with parents and with teachers. We use Love and Logic in the classroom, and it really is a beautiful composition of using communication principles among other principles to build relationships 
with our children while teaching them how to problem solve, be respectful, and work together. Mm -hmm. We start with ending the arguing in the back talk. And again, I was one, I would pull right into that arguing uh, with, with my kids. I'd start it. And what the first thing you have to do is break old habits. And you do that by, um, they call it going brain dead. We just stop and we replace it with what we call one-liners. Something that we memorize that keeps us from jumping in the way we used to, keep us from yelling and telling them our opinion right away. We memorize these one-liners that I'll give you an example. If your child is like, mom, it's no fair. Nice try. That's one of my one-liners that I use. Mom, you never let me do anything. Nice try. Mom, I can't stand you. Aren't you glad I don't believe you? Oh, mom, I am so, I'm going to move out of here the second I get a chance. Darling, I will love you no matter where you are. You. So it neutralizes those arguments and it gives you a chance to start working together. And there's other principles that take you from there, but you've got to stop that first. Yeah. And kind of change the dynamic of the relationship. The very next thing you're taught is empathy. You can say the same thing and say it two different ways, and it's gonna greatly affect how it comes across by your tone of voice, your mannerisms, um, just the way you word it, your intonation. It's very important for our kids to feel safe, especially when we're setting, we're allowing them to make some mistakes. Yeah. So instead of coming in and saying, what were you thinking? We step back with empathy and say, oh, that doesn't seem to turn out like you wanted it to. That can't feel good. And you're a safe, empathetic person. The second step is um, we use enforceable statements. And that is a huge change in the way we talk to our kids. And I'll explain. Let's say I'm struggling with a little one to brush their teeth at night. We have supper, they have dessert, but they're just refusing to brush their teeth or taking uh, way too long. Instead of telling them, you are going to brush your teeth. I, I can't enforce that unless I, I don't know what I'd have to do to enforce that. But instead, I would say, you know what, darling? I give dessert to little boys and girls that brush their teeth at night because I don't want your teeth to rot and I feel a lot more comfortable. Now, the first time you do that and they haven't brushed their teeth, you let them go to bed, no teeth brushed. The next day, you get the best dessert in the world. They want it, and you're like, darling, I'm sorry. I give dessert to little boys and girls that brush their teeth. <laughs> There's going to be a few tears for a night or two, but the very that night, they are going to brush their teeth. Yeah. And the next day, you have that dessert. And when they eat, I'd be glad to give you dessert. I give dessert to little boys and girls who brush their teeth. Yeah. So instead, you're saying what you can do, you're willing to do, and it really puts them puts everything back in their court for the follow through. Beautiful. So along with enforceable statements, we're going to go back to the empathy where if they are sad because they're not getting dessert, say, Oh, I know I, that's, that's such a bummer, but I know you're going to be able to work it out. So you get dessert tomorrow. I'm behind you all the way. So you really, it's not that where you're taunting them. I never nag and never repeat, never remind. You just let the consequences do the teaching. And that keeps you as a parent from being the bad guy. And it really does protect the relationship. And that's what this all is all about as parents and as teachers. We're guiding our children through thinking and problem solving while maintaining and growing that relationship that we have with them. This is a beautiful concept. Uh, and first of all, I like this name, love and logic. And then secondly, you're talking about so small things, which sometimes we tend to ignore. And because of our baggages, we tend to behave in a manner the way we have been behaving for so many years. 
as you just now said the two uh, the two important part of any child's journey are the teachers and parents if parents are communicating in this particular way the way you said and teachers are not doing it or if teachers are doing it and parents are not doing it definitely the child will get confused but as i said these two are the two pillars of any child's journey what message or some tips you would like to give to all the teachers who are listening to this episode and all the parents who will be watching this episode i think my biggest tip is just to really step back and evaluate whether you believe this would make a difference i know when we were first learning love and logic my husband and i had this discussion and we both grew up with parents that were very much do what i say and do it now and i think even more so for my husband it was a little bit of a a switch of thinking and he was asking me some questions about it and i said let me give you an example our youngest daughter um you've asked her to do her chores you're a little bit frustrated why doesn't she just do it you ask her you're the dad and i said but it's so important to teach our kids to think and i asked him the same question i said what if she she's almost 16 she's going to be going out on a date do you want her thinking or do you want her to simply do what a young man tells her to do and i remember him smiling and he says i get it i get it i want my daughter to think and so it takes a little bit of work to change the way we're talking to understand why we're doing what we're doing Absolutely. and making those changes but once you buy into that um it and you see the difference it makes in your relationship with your child um it is so worth it i can give you another example another uh, aspect of love and logic is shared control where we let them make choices within loving limits so with one of my grandchildren they their eyes were always bigger than their stomach was <laughs> so when we went out to eat i said i will buy um a happy meal if you choose which one again enforceable statements i buy happy meals if you make a choice which one hamburger cheeseburger chicken nuggets she walked right up to the counter little thing and ordered a double baconator cheeseburger <laughs> and and i i quickly put my hand up and told the lady no and i ordered just a simple nugget and a simple uh fry and a water and she was despondent and i showed empathy man i know but what did grammy say that is one of my one liners and she sat down beside me she ate it there was no happy meal prize it was just the basic chicken it wasn't a happy meal it was just the the uh entrees the next time that i took her out to eat she stepped up and i looked at her and i said i'll buy you a ha a happy meal if you if you choose which one and she stepped right up and ordered her chicken nugget happy meal with the drink she wanted i mean almost immediately and i was so proud of her because even with adults we'll go out to eat where do you want to go i don't want to i don't know where i want to go where do you want to go just that process of making decisions absolutely it's something that has to be developed mm -hmm. and it gave gave her such she was so proud of herself such a sense of of pride in her ability to make decisions so again i don't remind i don't prompt i tell them once if they don't choose and i do this as a, as a school teacher if they don't choose i just go ah and i choose for them and there's no oh maybe next time there's no arguing about it whatever i choose goes but i know you'll make a choice the next time and they do the next time i come up do you want to use a pencil or a pen instead of saying i want the marker so immediately i want to use the pen or i want to use the pencil whatever choices i've given them and that gives them that a sense that practice where you're teaching them how to start making decisions and choices for themselves beautiful i think these are small things that make huge difference while they are growing and they learn looks like very small but makes a big impact in their journey right I was just going to share um 
one of the final steps that we share in Love and Logic is how to hand the problem back. Let's say a child comes in and, well, I'll give you a personal example. I had one of my children, I told you I have six and nine grandchildren, actually got so mad one day that they hauled back and they were just, I don't know, they were just mad and they kicked at the wall and their foot went in the wall and made a hole. Shocked them. But before my first response would be, now I've left, I'm left with a mess to fix. But after love and logic, I didn't cause the problem. I'm not going to be the one that has to resolve the problem. When that child of mine came down, head down, so sad, Ron and I both had empathy. And we asked her, how are you going to solve this problem? So that's lovingly handing back the problem. And then the second step in that is asking, would you like some ideas? If they say yes, you give them a brief menu of ideas, but if they say no, you respect that. And in this situation, she said no. Mama had a repair guy, a contractor come, and I'm gonna give him a call and I'm gonna use my money to fix, have him come fix it. Worked for me. That's where I threw in an enforceable statement. I know you've got plans coming up with friends. You may go out with your friends once this problem is solved. So she went, she called the contractor, she set him up, he was supposed to come Saturday, she was going out Saturday night with her friends. He stood her up wow. and she was devastated. Mom, it's not my fault. I said, I know it's not your fault, baby, but I got a hole in my wall. And your dad and I said, you may go out with your friends once you've solved this problem. And it was a hard Saturday night for a young teenage girl. It was actually a series of, I think, a he stood her up one more time. She tried somebody else and he had just left the country. It was, we were on week four, no going out with friends. And it, there was no threats. It was just simple when she challenged us, baby, you can go out as soon as you solve this problem. And I had a hole in my wall for four weeks. Finally, um, I saw her and my husband heading out the front door and I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? And he goes, uh, she's been watching YouTube. She has a supply list. We're going to fix the wall. <laughs> and I was like, no, that's my wall. Fortunately, I kept my mouth shut. They went, they followed the directions. They cut it out the way the YouTube had shown them. They patched it. They textured it. They painted it. Wow. And Deepak, you couldn't find where they had repaired it. And she led the repair. So what teenage girl do you know that can fix drywall? But it was because of that process, because we stepped back in, in empathy and in love and in, in support, but we allowed her to solve that problem. There was no yelling, there was no lecturing, and it turned out to be, I've got a picture, they were laughing as they, as they fixed it. I guarantee you she'll never put her foot through the wall again. You know, that's a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. So these principles are so applicable to so many personalities. We uh, teach this for people that work with kids with special needs, with kids that have been traumatized, it's, we have, we tweak it a little bit for the preschoolers, and then we have Love and Logic for school age, and there's Love and Logic for teenagers. Same principles, but just tweaked for their, um, their age group. Great, super. Sure, I have a very uh, different question. You know, I have huge number of audience who will be listening to this episode in my home country, India. And India being a very big country with 1.4 billion population, touching 1.5, and we have huge competition in every field. So parents from childhood, I'm not saying all parents, I don't want to generalize, but like our parents have done it, a lot of my friends' parents have done it, and I see a lot of parents keep on doing these things. And when I used to do a little bit counseling with kids, kids used to tell me that parents pressurize us to do a particular thing. Okay. But we don't want to do that thing. 
we don't want to be a doctor or we don't want to be an engineer i don't know whether it happens in this country or not but in india it happens a lot because maybe i would think parents want to fulfill their dreams through their kids and in this whole process i don't know maybe kids have some dreams that they want to do something but they are not able to do it what do you suggest or what is your thought or what would you like to give message to parents how do they communicate in terms of career with their kids well that's a good question deepak i think for myself i was a horrible parent but it's all i knew it's all i had ever experienced it's what i saw growing up uh i I say horrible in that I lectured and I rescued and parts I absolutely loved my kids. Um but I was driven to be a good parent because I loved them but I only understood that authoritarian approach. An authoritarian approach to behavior is um I think the best way to describe it is picture yourself in a kindergarten class alone with 24 kindergartners. and you try use an authoritarian uh, approach it might work with one it might work with two but it is not going to work with a room full as teachers we understand that again back to what we said at the beginning teaching telling is not teaching Absolutely. teaching is a collaborative effort of guiding them guiding them through the experiences and the biggest thing is allowing them to make mistakes within loving limits. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh one of our children, well a couple of our girls, I gave them their monthly clothing allowance. One bought several very thrifty pieces. The other bought one piece of clothing, very expensive <laughs> designer. Uh that was great on day 1. but when her sister had several outfits to start school off and she had these one cool jeans she was sad she was like mom can i please i'm like baby that's your budget and i know when you get your budget next month you're going to spend it a little differently mm-hmm. and she did but we allowed her to make that mistake so we have to look at especially when they're young mistakes are a lot more affordable if they eat too much candy and get a tummy ache compared to they go to college and drink too much alcohol and end up in the hospital it is that's unaffordable so even with candy and my grandkids I'll be like mm, you know what you know you in some situations I'll let them make that choice and experience those consequences uh you spend too much you don't have enough money uh you, your allowance to go out with your friends when you're a kid that's an affordable um that's an affordable lesson you don't have enough money as an adult to pay your bills that's not affordable uh you crazy on your bicycle and your rocket that could be a lot more affordable than if you're flying around in a car and you wreck it that's not affordable so allowing our kids to make mistakes and not rescue them from those mistakes um had a friend she was telling her son put your bike in the garage put your bike in the garage and she stopped she said sure i've got to let him make a mistake it was this really cool brand new bike he left it outside next day it was gone and she had empathy she goes man i know how much you like that bike what are you going to do and he ended up doing chores and saving a little bit of money and going to goodwill and replacing it with a 25 dollar bike That's a tough lesson. But it's one he'll always remember. Absolutely. So I I think the biggest thing is let our kids make make some mistakes. Let them make some mistakes and fix it. Very important and because once they realize that it is their mistake and they are responsible for it, as the way you have said about your daughter, I think next time they will be more careful and they will be more responsible. Yeah. Is that right? there's one more trend uh, that we have seen in kids these days the trend is that because of a lot of technology and a lot of things happening around us a lot of kids goes into silence mode 
okay they are so involved into technology because parents don't know what they are involved in uh, everything has passwords and uh, everything is totally in their control and in this whole process they stop communicating with parents and they are more communicating with gadgets no how do we and most of the parents are facing this situation because they think that i don't know what my kid is doing they don't talk to us they finish their dinner very fast and go to their room they want to stay in their room this is a common challenge i think it is a common challenge all over the world what is your take on this that is a big one the technology i would go back to those enforceable statements you can have an hour on i let uh kids that eat dinner with the family and help us with the family chores have an hour on their tablet an hour of screen time you have to have loving limits but you put it there you can have and you don't promise that's why we use enforceable statement but you promised that i could get on the screen no i said um kids that do their homework and do it right and let me check it yeah. get a half an hour of screen time a uh, high five great job on the homework you've earned a half an hour of screen time do you want to set the timer or do you want me to set the timer there i've given them choices yeah. and if they don't um get off when the timer goes off just that empathy oh man we're going to have to try this again day after tomorrow we're going to have to take tomorrow to think about what went wrong here and so then you have a day without screen time and then the next day comes around i let little boys and girls who do their homework have some screen time 30 minutes Do you want to set the timer or do you want me to set the timer? And I guarantee you now sometimes when a kid's more strong-willed it might take a couple iterations of that. But that timer goes off, they are shutting that screen off. Because you're not going to argue. It goes back to that first point, I'm not going to argue about it. It's so sad, but the it goes off and it's going to go away. There are consequences to your choices and we protect our kids from that. Okay. um way too much but screen time using all these principles it really is a lot easier than you would think uh to kind of come to a collaboration with your kids on that i think this is a nice key i think both parents and teachers has to collaborate with kids uh and when they thinking it is not enforcement or it is not authority it is more of a collaboration coming from parents and teachers i think exactly. they are more open and more receptive in this whole process mm -hmm. what you said just now is very much can be talked on communicated to the kids who are up to like 14 15 years of age but once they become teens means teens means they are like 16 17 and 18 and they have their own thoughts they have their own opinions and very strong opinions and they totally stop communicating with parents and i go to a lot of parents and they said they don't talk is it a age or is there a way we can build that communication open communication in the family one of the last points that we teach in um Love and Logic is how to get kids to make to do their chores, their their family contributions, and that that's not exactly communication, but it does play in to the sense. I think a lot of our kids act like and feel like honored guests in our home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I can give you an example. Once I started embracing this thought, this concept before. Um, Are you, I'll pick on my youngest because she was the last one home, and that was about when we were learning these principles. Uh, when it came to grocery shopping, I'd come home from the store, and it was like pulling teeth just to get her to stop doing what she was doing, screen time or whatever, and help me unload. So I took a very, very different approach. We're in this together. I'm going grocery shopping. I've made the list. Somebody's got to shop. Somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to load it in the car. Yeah. Somebody's got to unload it. Yeah. And somebody's got to put it away. Pick two that you want to do. <laughs> Now she was smart. She would go to the store with me. 
And she knew that when we came out and she, if she chose load it in the trunk, that I'd actually help her. And I would never more than half, never more than 50%, but I would actually help her. And then she would choose to unload. So when we got home, a big family, lots of groceries, I would grab a handful and carry it in and start unloading while she, or start putting away while she unloaded. And it just became such an automatic, like this is a team thing. Mom's not here to do everything for everybody. We, I need you, you need me. And just breaking things down that I did in the house. And it really changed our connection, that sense of you're not an honored guest in our home. You're part, you're an invaluable member of this family and we need each other. So just in the way you present, um, and that builds the relationship, and the relationship is where that two-way communication, they want to talk to you, they want to work with you, they want to spend time with you as the relationship grows. Absolutely. Uh, my last question uh, during our discussion is, especially during this pandemic, a lot of kids are sitting at home, Introverts are getting more introverts. Extroverts are getting frustrated because they are not able to go out. Parents are also facing a lot of challenges because they not only have to do work of their office, but they also have to take care of their kids. You see these kind of things, and especially grandmother to nine grandchildren and mother to six kids. What are you doing managing them and family? I think we've had to be very creative. We've learned how to play some of our favorite family games on over Zoom. Okay. Um, we've done a lot more Zooming as a family. We've gotten out in nature where you can socially distance a little more. My husband's an avid disc golf player, and you can, uh, it's very easy to socially distance on the disc golf uh, course. So pick that up a little bit, getting a little bit better. Yeah. But it's really understanding we're all, when it comes to behavior, uh, things have been ripped away from us immediately. And that really goes to, you know, it's there and it's gone. And you really can, uh, the behavioral term is extinction burst, where something's ripped away from somebody and they go, wow, and then it's just like you just implode. And being able to talk to our kids about that, it's okay, I'm frustrated too. I just wanna scream, I want this to be over. But you know what? We still, and remembering this, we still have a choice. Even when our anxiety is high, when we just want to see our friends, we still have a choice in how we're going to respond. And we're going to be creative. And taking those times, putting your work down, and making those memories together, not just sending them off to use their creative creativity, but being creative with them. Um, has been uh, kind of a highlight. There's definitely there's definitely some negatives, but there's a lot of positives that have come out of this COVID experience. Good. Thank you so much. I think this is a great insight that uh, we have got from you. One thing that you would like to share, the learning from love and logic that every parent should imbibe to make this relationship more stronger and more lovable? Just taking the pressure off yourself, uh, really challenging those authoritarian um, type expectations on yourself. The biggest thing for me, letting my kids make mistakes, was I had to stop and, and really be honest about how much I cared what other people thought of me, my family, and if my kids are messing up, what are other people gonna think? So a lot of the changes were internal in me. And as I changed and started responding and reacting to my children differently, I started seeing that change in our relationship. Absolutely. Um, definitely, um, I have, relationships with all of my kids my husband and I both do that we never thought we could see and it's just and it keeps growing just that mutual respect but um, just that critical um, understanding that this is your family this is your bullseye 
everybody else is out, you you can't worry about what people uh, think. You really have to do what's best for you and your children. Absolutely. And you rightly said, as Gandhi also said, if you want to see the change, be the change. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Cher, uh, for sharing with us so many good things on how to communicate with our most important family members, our children, in this journey. Would you like to share a little bit about love and logic so that people can learn more about it? Like I said, they, their company has been hit hard by COVID, but I know if you go on to Amazon, um, you can still buy their books, Love and Logic, either for teens or parents. Okay. Uh, the resources are out there. You might even be able to find it in uh, the public library. Okay. And I know there's a lot of e-versions of that going on between uh, the libraries. But get your, get your hands on one of the books. Um, the wisdom and the principles uh, that they use, they didn't create it. They're timeless. But the way they have packaged it, uh, makes it very user friendly. Um, it, it's been a lifesaver for our family. It's been one of those genera generational shifts uh, for our family in the way things are done. So um, I know there's other resources from Love and Logic on YouTube or um, different podcasts that may still be available. You won't regret. Get your hands on it and just invest that time in picking up one skill. If you can just, we usually start with the go brain dead and use your one-liners, just neutralizing the arguing. If you can neutralize the arguing, it's gonna leave you hanging like what's next? But it's almost like uh, breaking up with a boyfriend and it wasn't a real good relationship, but you gotta break up before you move on. And then once you you can put that arguing and back talk aside, then you can move on and kind of embrace a whole new set of lovely principles that you're going to want to hang on to for a lifetime. Thank you, Cher. And friends, remember the one word, collaboration. It's not about yes. telling or teaching. It's all about collaboration. Thank you, Cher, for coming on this show, Converse with Deepak. It was my pleasure to have you on this show. Keep inspiring with your uh, messages to the world of love and logic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deepak. Goodbye.